dedicatory prayer to our Lord, dedicating the time that is before us to his honor and glory. Would you bow with me, please? Father, we gather with these, your people, here in this place to honor you, to worship you, to extol you, to adore you. We want to lift the name of Christ high in this place. We recognize Jesus as our Savior, recognize his preeminence that should be had in this place. We praise you that Jesus has purchased this church with his blood. He is our chief shepherd. And so, Father, we, we recognize we have everything to thank you for, certainly nothing to complain about because you are good all the time. We are humbled by your goodness. We fail you so often, and yet you are long-suffering, you are forgiving, you are gracious, and we just marvel at your character. And it is with that kind of gospel understanding that we now get to sing your praise and study your word and fellowship with your people and give to your cause. Just everything that's before us, we want it to be pleasing in your sight. And also, we just pray that the condition of our hearts would be humble before you, um, grateful before you, enthusiastic about what you have done. We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Get your hymn books out. We're going to begin with number 117. It's the Christmas season full force, so we'll be singing Christmas hymns this morning. We're, we're going to begin with O Little Town of Bethlehem, the first, the second, and the fourth. pages to number 114. We'll continue with the first Noel. I looked it up just a few minutes ago, and a Noel is a song, a Christmas song, and also Christmas itself. So the first Noel is about the first Christmas carol that was ever sung, and it was the angels that sang it. So we're going to be singing the first Noel, the first song, first, fourth, fifth, and sixth.
Amen. Brother Klein is going to lead us in a prayer for the offering. Our Father, we again thank you for the opportunity to be in church today, to be able to sing praises to you, and thank you so much that we can celebrate this season when you showed your great love to us in sending Christ to earth and his willingness to come, to die on the cross, to be buried and to uh, rise again, paying the penalty for our sin. Lord, we pray this morning, if anyone here does not know Christ as their Savior, they'll hear the message clear and accept Christ as their Savior. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to bring our tithes and offerings. We ask for your blessing upon the church as uh, we use these monies to further the gospel and to reach the city of Pensacola in the area. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have to say, I think we have the best violinist in the world. <laughs> Our scripture reading this morning is found in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. We'll read verses 39 through 45. I'll read the odd verses, and you'll read the even, so I'll read 39, you read 40, and so on. If you'll stand with us as we read the scripture together. Luke chapter 1, verse 39. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And blessed is she that believeth, uh, that believed, and for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you that you came to this earth and that you died for us. And as this, this passage simply talks about um, you who uh, was with Mary and Elizabeth, her mother, we thank you for the joy that you bring to all of us, especially at this time of year. And as the next verse, verse 46 said, Mary exalted the Lord through her, uh, through her soul. We pray that this Christmas season that we would not just exalt you with our mouths, but that we would also exalt you simply in our hearts and in our souls, and that you would be known. Thank you for the joy that you bring us, and we pray that we would remember that above all else this Christmas season, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing. We're going to continue singing about the songs of Christmas with number 112. Number 112, there's a song in the air. Sing with me.
I see most of you have found your way back to your seat. I hope you shook the hand of someone you knew and then someone you didn't. So if you are not at 112, uh, turn there with me and we'll sing the last verse of There's a Song in the Air. We rejoice in the We are blessed to have a missionary in our midst. Brother Shreve, would you come to the platform at this time? Missionary to Chile, uh, a missionary of the Vision Baptist Missions Board. Some of you have heard of them. We do currently support a couple missionaries associated with that board. While we're talking about the furtherance of the gospel, because that's exactly what missionaries endeavor to do, I do want to mention to the church family that in the church tract racks, uh, there are some Christmas-themed gospel tracts, and this is a very good time, an easy opportunity to communicate the gospel to people all around you, especially as you talk about the real meaning of Christmas. And so uh, avail yourself of these gospel tracts on your way out of church uh, this morning. Brother, go ahead. Yes, sir. Well, hey, man, good morning. I'm very happy to be here with you. My family is with me. Um, uh, my wife, Hannah, is feeding uh, Isaiah. He's six months old. He's our son. Uh, I'm a big guy, and I like to eat. My son, he is a big guy, and he likes to eat. So she may be there a little bit, but she will be with us later. Uh, our daughter, Isabella, is two and a half. Um, if a whirlwind of blonde hair and Christmas ribbons approaches you with a prayer card, that is, that's our daughter. So please just, <laughs> please just stand still, and she'll just move by you. Uh, we are missionaries to Chile, and uh, we are uh, on deputation. We're about 62 63% support. We're looking to leave next summer. We do have some prayer cards uh, right here back at our display. Please get one. Uh, we've just got 5,000 in, so we have plenty to give out for you. Um, and like I said, on the way to Santiago, Chile, and a little bit, I uh, did a little bit of research. This is, is it Escambia County? Is that how y'all say it? Yep, yep. Okay, Escambia County. So the, uh, the area that this county takes up is uh, 875 miles, give or take. So 875 miles is the size of this county with a population of about 320,000 people. That's a pretty big population. Uh, I'm from a town of 1,000 people. And so that is a lot bigger than where I am from. Uh, now, Santiago, by way of comparison, is only 250 square miles. So three, three and a half times smaller land-wise than your county, but there's over 7 million people in that city. So you'll see it, you'll see it in the video. I mean, it is, a, a, forget social distancing, forget spreading out. It is people on top of people. And even on the prayer card in the uh, bottom part here, you can see part of the city and it's just, I mean, it's just buildings, and they just go up, because that's the, it's the only way to go. The whole East Coast is Andes Mountains. The whole West Coast is Pacific Ocean, so you can't build out in the ocean. Can't build, you just go up. And so a uh, lot of people, not a lot of space. You can stand on a street corner, and you walk for 15 minutes, and you've passed about 50,000 people. And so uh, we are going to Chile to plant churches. That's what God has called us to do. And I don't know how many churches you need for 7 million people. I know it's more than what there is. Uh, that is, I can't even especially since you figure that people uh, here sometimes drive in the States to drive 30, 35 minutes one way to get to church. Uh, in Chile, not everybody has a car. In South America, a car is, is a luxury. And so a church this size on a Sunday morning, you might have two, three, four people who drive to church. Everybody else will be taking a bus or a train or walking. And so I don't really think you want to be taking four and five and six um, transfers on a bus with your kids on Sunday morning to get to church. So you have to plan a lot more churches because people just can't go as far. So I don't have an exact number of how many churches they need. They need at least one more. Uh, and so we are going down there to start not, not just one church, but you do have to start with the first church. Um, and I'm excited about that. I really love the local church. I really do. I, if you read your Bible, you read your New Testament, you will also love the local church. And we, we celebrate Christmas, and I love Christmas. And I don't get people, especially Christians, who, you know, they don't like singing uh, Christmas music in church. I'm like, that's the, that's the best music. It's about Jesus. How do you not like that? But... Uh, as we talk about Christmas and Jesus was born, I mean, he was born, uh, but he grew up. He became a man and he lived and died and resurrected. And one of the things that he did is he said, I will build my church. And then, listen, there are a lot of good organizations and a lot of good um, causes in the world, but there's only one thing that Jesus himself promised he would build. And this is it, the church. 
this is the only thing that has God's, uh, I don't want to say seal of approval, but his stamp that he will be involved in building. So I don't think it is uh, wrong to want to be involved in building a church. I don't think it's wrong to want to see your church grow. I think Jesus wants that because he said that he would build his church. And so Chile is a very different country than America. I mean, it's South America. This is North America. That is South America. You think, well, it's only, it's, it's America. So how different could it be? It's a very different America. Um, you'll see in the video when we were younger, we were missionaries in Peru. And the people tell me all the time, you're an American, I'm an American, we're the, we're the same. I was like, my passport is blue, your passport is red. It's not the same thing, right? My dollar bills are green, yours are not. It's, it's very, very different. Language is different. And if you know Spanish, uh, Chilean Spanish is a very unique Spanish. I mean, as soon as you hear somebody speak from Chile, you, you, there's no denying where they're from. The only way I could compare it to you in English is think of somebody from, like, Philadelphia, my mom's from Philadelphia, so I can pick on Philadelphia, okay? It's somebody who, they, they talk very fast, their words are very cut. That's what, so it's a very different language, it's a very different culture, especially in 7 million people compared to, you know, rural culture where I grew up. I mean, but here's the thing, is all those differences, I don't have to wonder if the church will work. Yeah. Because Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say, I will build it in the southeast of America, nowhere else. I will build it with uh, North Americans, I will build it with this. He said, I will build my church, period. And when he gave that promise, he, he actually wasn't in the southeast of America. He wasn't speaking English. He was he, he's not in Pensacola, Florida. He's in a different continent, speaking a different language. And the church has grown 2,000 years, but it has grown all around the world. And so we are excited uh, to get down there and start planting churches. Um, we'll be working with uh, Jason and Lori Holt. They are veteran missionaries uh, also out of our church and board. They've been in Chile 16 years. God's used them to start 11 churches and uh, one Bible college there. And um, I was talking to him the other day, and I said, there's a lot of goals that I have in ministry. With 7 million people, I mean, you, you, that is like job security for a church plan. There's always somewhere else you can start a church. So I have a lot of goals and dreams and plans. We were talking about this. And so one, I mean, the, like the number one box that I want to check off is I just want to start one church. And turned it over to a Chilean pastor. It just, it just keeps running without me. It doesn't need my money. It doesn't need my leadership. That it just, right, when you have kids, you want them to grow up and, and get married and move out and, and be successful and start their own family, right? That's, and you know, I, I, you'll miss them. I mean, Isabella's not quite three. She just got her nails painted for the first time, and so I had to deal with that uh, existential crisis. But you, you want them to grow up, and you want a church to, 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 as a church planner, you want that church to not need you anymore. And so, obviously, I want to start churches that can start churches, start more than one church, but I want to start that first church. And uh, we are excited to get to Chile next year and do that. Uh, God has blessed our deputation. We started two months before COVID hit, last January. We started, so not a great time to really start anything, uh, but God blessed us through that. And even though, I mean, March to August, pretty much no meetings. I said 62%. We picked up two new churches um, already this month. And so, uh, praying that God would get us to Chile um, next year. So if you have any other questions, anything I didn't cover, we'll be in the back. We are no hurry to get out of here. Please come by, talk, ask questions, us, Ministry Chili, whatever. Um, we'd love to talk to you about that. And uh, we have a quick video. It's about two, two and a half minutes. I'll tell you a little bit more um, about us. And uh, thank you so much for letting us be here. For many years, Chile has been a very blessed country. They have had peaceful life and a stable and growing economy. But in October of 2019, that began to change. Due to unhappiness with the rising cost of living, as well as many other social issues, protests in Santiago, Chile, a city of over 7 million people, quickly turned into riots. During these riots, several lives were lost and billions of dollars of damage was done to businesses in the area. The Chilean army was even deployed in an attempt to stop these rioters. However, they did not have much success, as you can see. On the heels of these riots, COVID-19 soon made its way to South America. The result being that everyday life, including churches, were shut down and in a state of almost constant quarantine or worse, lockdown. In Matthew chapter number 9, when Jesus sees the multitudes, he is moved with compassion on them because they fainted, they were scattered abroad, and they were as sheep having no shepherd. When Jesus saw this situation, he responded, 
by asking the disciples to pray for laborers. More important than any physical need a people may have is their spiritual need. We are Kyle, Hannah, Isabella, and Isaiah Shreve. We have previously served a missionary term in Peru, South America, where we were able to see people saved, baptized, and discipled. We know the Spanish language. We have adapted to Latin American culture. And in only a few short months after arriving on the field, we will be ready to plant another local independent Baptist church. Lord willing, we are leaving in the summer of 2022 for Santiago, Chile. I would ask you to please pray about financially supporting us as we go to Chile. And as always, please keep our deputation in your prayers. At this time, the uh, junior church is dismissed. Thank you, Brother Kyle, for that. I thought it was very interesting on how you said that uh, Pensacola is very small compared to there. I'm a Kansas farm boy, and I thought Pensacola was crowded. So <laughs> I appreciate Pensacola a lot more now. <laughs> so. All right. Well, in Kansas at the camp, we used to go to um, the camp director would always say before every service, he would have the church bow their head, close their eyes, and they would ask, and he would ask, he said, um, if anyone here is willing to respond, if God speaks to you, would you raise your hand? And we're not going to do that. But I think that's a good question for all of us to ask ourselves before the pastor comes to speak. And uh, I hope that we're all ready and willing to listen and to respond if God would have us. So, um, now pastor's going to come with the message. Thank you, Brother Stephen. I feel tremendously blessed already by our gathering this morning, just the enthusiasm with which many of you sang praise to our Lord and uh, the good fellowship we have enjoyed. Uh, I especially appreciate the missionary presentation and just the burden that is evident uh, and so thankful for their calling and, and the enabling that God provides, the equipping God provides uh, for, for God-called missionaries. So. Uh, I feel strengthened by our fellowship already. If you feel the same, would you say amen? It's wonderful. Now, I invite you to turn your attention, please, to Luke's gospel, the passage from which our scripture reading was delivered. We will look at Luke uh, chapter 1 uh, and consider content from verses 39 all the way through verse 56. And I know this is somewhat familiar territory to many of us, as this is included here in uh, Luke's infancy narrative, um, and, and in spite of its familiarity, I want to uh, commend it to your consideration this morning and your prayerful application. Um, every time you get to a passage that you may already know pretty well, you still ought to be saying, Lord... Teach me something and, and show me and strengthen me and convict me and, and rebuke me if needed and, and help me. Uh, because, ladies and gentlemen, when the word of God is preached, the voice of God is heard. And so we endeavor to preach the word and you then and, and I with you, uh, we turn our ear to heaven and say, Lord, speak to me by your spirit. Um, I heard somebody explaining this week, something that I found very helpful, and I give it to you just by way of introduction, uh, and I give it to you in a much briefer way, but he described and referenced in specific many people that are against Christmas. They're against Jesus, or just God in general. And the movements throughout human history led by different individuals to uh, do away with the message of the gospel and do away with uh, the celebration of Christmas. I mean, those movements are numerous as you recollect what you know uh, about even just the history of our country. Um, and in spite of all those that are completely against God, uh, Christmas, if you will, marches on. I mean, uh, the celebration of Christians around the world in relationship to the incarnate God and the virgin conception, these celebrations, they march on in spite of the atheistic movement and in spite of 
the sentimentalism that surrounds Christmas, that sometimes undermines Christmas, um, all of it marches on. As our brother said, why does it march on? It marches on because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The cause of Christ marches on year after year and day after day uh, through the hearts and, and the lives of the redeemed. It's a wonderful thing. And uh, to further explain just a little bit about what I just said, this idea of sentimentalism uh, that kind of undermines sometimes Christmas, it is, it is a danger to be considered. And the way to refute sentimentalism undermining uh, Christmas in America, the way to refute it is to make sure that we have depth of understanding in relationship to incarnation and infancy explanations in Scripture. In other words, it, you know, in the Bible Belt, there is a tendency for people to say Merry Christmas and I love Christmas and to do a lot of Christmas tradition with like a step back towards what the Bible actually says, you know. It's like a, a surface level. It's a, a verbal ascent to Christmas and the celebration, the recognition of it, without a real mental and, and heartfelt understanding. Um, it, it's a good thing for uh, Christians to be very familiar with Old and New Testament passages that teach us the importance of God incarnate and the virgin conception. It's a healthy thing so that it's not just a surface understanding and a sentimental kind of celebration, but it is a recognition in the a recognition of the, the, the thousands of years represented in relationship to the prophecies in the Old Testament and then the fulfillment of those prophecies in the New Testament and then the idea of a second advent prophesied that is yet to come when he comes back uh, to this earth. I mean, it spans over thousands of years. And so it is healthy for, for, for God's people, for Christians, to be familiar and to study closely if you haven't already this, this Christmas season, to study closely and be familiar with passages like Micah, Micah 5, 2. And, and maybe even jot some of these references down. I'm going to say seven, six or seven of them for you. And, and, I, and I hope if you haven't this month of December yet, if you haven't taken time with your families or maybe on your own to study passages like Micah 5, 2, which prophesied exactly where the Messiah would be born, it, it'd be a good thing for you to study that. And, and then maybe to continue your study by going to Isaiah 7, 14, and not just the familiar verse of uh, for 14, but maybe some of the content uh, that leads up to the situation with Ahaz and the sign that is given and, and then the sign that a virgin shall conceive. So, so read Isaiah 7.14 and study it closely. Read Isaiah 9.6, these names uh, that, that further elaborate who the Emmanuel is. Um, then maybe get into the New Testament and read that Matthew tells us in Matthew 1.23 that Emmanuel is being interpreted as God with us. Matthew wants you to believe that the Emmanuel is not just Isaiah's son in Isaiah 8, but that the Emmanuel is Jesus of Nazareth. If you believe that, say amen. Uh, and so read Matthew 1 and read Matthew 2 and read Luke 1 where we are this morning and read Luke 2. And then even consider, now this would be bonus and extra credit, but then even read stuff that Paul wrote about the incarnation. Read and study Galatians 4.4. 4, and read incarnation passages like Philippians 2. And if you'll take time every December to walk through these many passages, what will happen is if you have currently kind of a surface or sentimental appreciation for Christmas, and don't get me wrong, sentimentalism has its place and family traditions uh, can be just fine and frankly harmless and sometimes helpful. I'm not against being sentimental about the incarnation and not against family traditions, but I would be against them if they represent uh, an absence of understanding some of the depths that have been entrusted to us uh, in relationship to the details of what God has done for sinners such as us. Let it not be true of the members of North Stone Baptist Church nor of this pastor that, that we, we just go through a routine of something that we don't really understand and have no interest in understanding. Um, and so, so the opposite then, let it be true that we desire to know him on an even deeper level 
and, uh, and to study his word and to steward his word well. Um, all right, so the text that's before us, we kind of pick up where we left off. If you remember last Sunday morning, uh, those of you that were able to be with us, we were in Luke chapter 1, and uh, we considered Gabriel's good news. We considered how Gabriel communicated the good news to Mary uh, that, sh- that, that she would conceive and there would be a virgin conception and that the Holy Ghost would uh, come upon her and, and the power of the highest shall over- overshadow her. Um, and, and so Gabriel communicates good news and her initial response was, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? But eventually, as she and Gabriel continued to dialogue, she went from, how shall this be, to, so be it unto me. In other words, I don't understand this potential biological impossibility, but eventually, she just by faith said, uh, so be it unto me. She was in the, as I said last Sunday morning, the amen section. You know, humbly before God, just saying, God, I, I, I want your will for my life. Um, and so, keeping that as a background in our minds, we now move into verse 39 uh, and following and consider this content with this title. If you're a note taker, you could jot this title down. Uh, and that would be Blessed Baby Shower. Okay? I feel like a lot like in the 21st century, ladies get together and you're excited uh, for one uh, who is pregnant, she's with child, and uh, in the 21st century context, ladies will get together and play games maybe and give gifts and, uh, and, and just that kind of stuff, maybe gossip a little, I don't know, but uh, you know, they'll just get together and just do what ladies do, you know, and, uh, and, and, and eat, okay, and just have a good time, you know, uh, a blessed baby shower, well... Uh, in part, what's happening in 39 all the way through uh, 56 here, in part, is a couple ladies are getting together and they're very excited and they're being a blessing one to another. If, if you followed along in the scripture reading or you read ahead in the passage, you'll see that's exactly what they're doing is they're being a blessing one to another. Elizabeth and Mary are together trying to bless one another and that's kind of the, the core of what happens even in 21st century baby showers uh, when, when ladies honor one another and celebrate uh, the, the new life within the womb of a woman. All right, so blessed baby shower is what we entitle this text. And what I'd like you to see are four major elements, and I give them to you now, and then we will walk through the text and consider these ideas. The first is the greeting or the salutation. So what's going on in the blessed baby shower? Well, there's greeting. Then secondly, there's leaping, which I think is a lot of fun. The baby, of course, leaping, uh, John the Baptist. So leaping, then there's blessing, referred to several times in these verses in different ways. And then there is magnifying, and that is really 46 through 56, uh, Mary's song of praise. So to review, we will see the greeting, the leaping, the blessing, and the magnifying in this blessed baby shower. All right, so first of all, the greeting or the salutation. Um, Notice verse number 39, Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. Um, And according to Matthew Henry's commentary, this is Hebron. Verse number 40, and entered into the house of Zacharias and notice this word, saluted Elizabeth. This is uh, what I'm calling the greeting. Um, And this is an emphasis in the text. It's not just some passing idea uh, where in a cliche way, somebody says, hey, I'm here, how are you? You know, fine, how are you? And then they move on. No, there's more of an emphasis here in in this salutation because it's restated again in verse, or at least referenced in verse number 41. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary. Um, And then again in verse number 44, for lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears. So three times in the text, this idea of greeting or salutation is mentioned. And uh, really, it is more, like I say, than just a a, a surface, quick, kind of cliche greeting. It's very likely a greeting and an explanation. A greeting and an explanation of what's been going on in Mary's life. It's... It's more than just a a girl going to her girlfriend and saying, hey girl, (laughs) 
You know, it, there's more to it than that. It's, it's, hey girl, and then what you've been, what, what you've been up to? Well, let me just tell you, I met the angel Gabriel, okay? And, uh, and here's what Gabriel said. And, and so there's, there's greeting and then explanation involved. And it's very likely that you would expect, certainly, that she, Mary, has already talked to Joseph by the time she goes and talks to Elizabeth, her friend. It's very likely that the content of Matthew 1 where uh, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream and communicates that that which is conceived in Mary is of the Holy Ghost. And, and so, you know, he was minded to put her away, and he was a just man, so he was going to put her away uh, privily, the Bible says. He, he loved her. But then the angel of the Lord in a dream put Joseph at ease. And so it's very likely Mary has already explained all of this to Joseph. And the angel of the Lord helped Joseph understand these things. And now, Mary, in this salutation, in this greeting, is explaining a lot of this to Elizabeth. And, and so, yeah, it makes sense that once this has been explained, that verse 41, the babe, referring to John the Baptist, leapt in her womb. Um, there is excitement after this salutation, excitement in the heart of Elizabeth, who is filled with the Holy Ghost, and even excitement in the greatest man born among women, John the Baptist, as he is then in his mother's womb. So there is the greeting or the salutation. Secondly, this morning, consider with me the leaping. The leaping. Notice again verse number 41, the babe leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. This also is restated. It's, it's mentioned more than once. It's verse 44, again, where the babe leapt in uh, um, my womb for joy. Okay, so Dr. Luke, the human penman here, the physician, he wants us uh, to understand the salutation and appreciate it. But then he also, because he's restating this idea of the babe leaping in the mother's womb, he wants to highlight this as well. Um, and uh, we're not that far away from the third Sunday in January when as a church we have every year the last several years and this year will be the same where we will um, recognize this idea of right to life Sunday. Sanctity of human life Sunday. It is from this passage and many others that we understand that the baby is a baby before the baby has actually traveled through the birth canal, you know? While the baby is still in the womb, here is John the Baptist living and leaping, if you will, in the womb of his mother. Um, these verses help us articulate our anti-abortion position. Um, sanctity of human life. And Dr. Luke wants you to see that there is life living in Elizabeth's womb here. And this life is responding. Now, it's interesting that Mama, Elizabeth, the Bible plainly says, is filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you see that at the end of verse number 41? Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Do you understand that John the Baptist as well, Luke chapter 1 indicates, John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. And so what is it that prompts the leaping of John the Baptist? Well, it is the Holy Spirit of God. That John the Baptist would have a zeal and appreciation for the, the announcement that Mary is going to conceive and, and she is going to conceive of the Holy Ghost and that she is going to deliver the Messiah. This causes spirit-filled people to be excited and to be thankful and maybe even to jump a little. Okay? Uh, even dignified independent fundamental Baptists, you know, uh, who are stayed upon Jehovah, you know. Uh, yeah, we ought to be serious about the things of God, but at the same time, we ought to be excited about what Jesus is doing in our lives. Um, and so there is a greeting, and there is leaping, but then there is also blessing in the text. And this also is referred to more than once, three or four times as I tabulate, but it is, uh, it is blessing in a variety of different ways, okay? Um, so notice verse number 42, the Bible says, and she came, uh, and she spake out with a loud voice. So this is Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says to Mary, blessed, you see this blessing. 
Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Elizabeth, a spirit-filled individual, is communicating a blessing to her friend, her girlfriend, probably, uh, certainly married a, a teenager. Interesting, too, by the way, the age difference between Elizabeth and Mary. And yet friends, close friends. Uh, some people have the fault, faulty notion that you can only be friends with people in your peer group. You know, whether if you, you know, that's silly. That is, frankly, you know, it's anti-biblical to say exclusively, I can only be friends with people in my uh, social age and stage. And I get it that we relate to people that are going through the same struggles and life situations that we are. Uh, so yeah, have some friends in your age and stage. But it's a Titus 2 principle that you would also seek counsel if you're young from those that are older. And a Titus 2 principle that those that are older uh, would be humble enough and, and biblically literate enough and wise enough and in pursuit of the filling of the Spirit uh, that, that they would then have have counsel to offer those that are younger. It is a good thing for younger people to be humble enough to go to older people and have friendships with them and to be around them and to be teachable uh, and on and on. And, and that's what's in view here. This older uh, Elizabeth is communicating to the younger Mary a blessing. Has somebody ever done something for you? And uh, here we are in the South, you know, and in the South people say, Bless your heart, you know, and, uh, and they're just trying to express the appreciation. And in the South, somebody will bring somebody else a sweet tea, and you say, bless your heart for giving me this sweet tea. You know, you're just trying to communicate to them that you appreciate them, and you want God's favor and grace to rest on them for, uh, you know, what maybe they have done for you. And Elizabeth is just trying to communicate uh, a blessing, positivity towards Mary. Isn't it interesting that... Elizabeth is not skeptical of what Mary has gone through. At no point do you see any skepticism in the heart of Elizabeth. I think that's so interesting because, you know, if I mean, you, you know the, the account uh, and your friend comes to you and says, yeah, an angel appeared to me. His name was Gabriel. You're like, yeah, right. You know, I mean, there would be skepticism. But she's not skeptical. Why is she not skeptical? Again, it's because she's filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is the message of the good news. This is the message of the incarnate God. Um, and, and when we get into this next section here of magnifying, right now I'm talking about blessing, but, you know, Mary's song of praise, 46 through 56, uh, is Mary magnifying the Lord. And if you've read it and you're familiar with it, you know that it is absolutely saturated with Scripture. Mary references all kinds of uh, scriptural passages. And I'm saying that Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Ghost. That's why she responds with faith and not skepticism. But as Mary magnifies the Lord, she does it saturated with Scripture. So we've got, we got Spirit-filled individuals and we've got Scripture-saturated individuals. And both of them probably grew up under the Shema of Deuteronomy 6. You know, teaching your children diligently the word of God to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's why she, Elizabeth didn't respond with skepticism. Instead, she responds with blessing. And that's why Mary's song of praise is so saturated with Scripture because they were raised in, in, in an environment that taught them the Old Testament, that taught them the B-I-B-L-E. Very valuable. Train up a child in the way that he should go so that when he is old, he will not depart from it. Like, they're looking at these circumstances. These ladies, these godly ladies, are looking at their circumstances um, through the lens of what they know about the Bible. As opposed to looking at their circumstances through the lens of emotion or surprise or faithlessness. It's actually uh, looking at it through the lens of faithfulness. So notice the blessing, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, um, in verse number 42, but then also at verse number 43, from whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come uh, to me? And, and just notice here how uh, it, it, the mother of my Lord, Elizabeth is not emphasizing the mother, she is emphasizing the Lord. She is revealing 
her faith in the, the messianic prophecies that are being fulfilled through this young girl named Mary. Um, and the emphasis there on, on the Lord, the Lord should come. Uh, and so there's a sense of humility uh, in this blessing. Notice verse number 40, uh, 45, and blessed is she that believed. We're still talking about blessing. Blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. All right, so there's greeting, there's leaping, there's blessing, and then the remainder of the content is magnifying. And here Mary goes, magnifying the Lord. And, and yes, she's had some amazing revelation from God that very likely we will not have in 21st century Christianity. I mean, she had an angelic appearance. Now, we have revelation from the Lord uh, through the 66 books and 1,189 chapters, more than 788,000 words. This is what God reveals about himself to us. So yeah, she had an angelic appearance, and that was God's revelation to her. But she also took very seriously the canonized revelation of God at the time. And we know that again because if you read this song of praise in these verses, it, it, there are phrases from the book of Psalms and the book of Samuel, uh, and there's just so much here that showed Mary took very seriously the written revelation of Almighty God. And if you want to study this with your family or, or study it even further than we will this morning, one thing you could do that is kind of a fun exercise is to make like two columns on a sheet of paper and to write down words in these uh, 11 verses here that Mary used to describe God and write them all down. How did he refer to God and the attributes? And, and it's magnifying. That's what we're talking about. Her, her soul doth magnify the Lord. So how does she do that? In what ways does she refer to God? What are the attributes about God, at least in this passage, that she is adoring? You could write them all down in one column. And then in another column, write down the ways she refers to herself. As I tabulated it, I did this. I did this kind of quickly. I came up with eight references to either names of God or attributes of God. And then five, maybe six references to Mary. And ladies and gentlemen, I mean, we all want to, hopefully we all have times where we're magnifying the Lord uh, and moments where we just marvel, look what God did and look what God is doing. And wow, and it's, it's out of uh, sincere gratitude that we say, I'm going to pause right now, whatever's going on in my life, and just magnify the Lord. Well, how do we do that? Well, Mary gives us a blueprint for that. She takes time to, remember last week I talked about how thoughtful Mary was, even as a young lady, uh, how thoughtful she was as a person. She's not just winging it in life, not flying by the seat of her pants, as they say. Fundamental Baptist, you know, flying by the seat of her culottes, okay? She wasn't, uh, she, she was a very mindful person. Three times in the New Testament, you find her pondering things in her heart. And so it's easy for her to talk about who God is and to do it in an extensive kind of a way. It's not just, okay, he's God. And, and I love him, and, it's, and that's it. No, there's, and that's fine. But as you grow in the Lord, and as you study his word, as she did as a little girl, I mean, you can really, listen, the longer you've been in a relationship with somebody, the more you should know about them. And the easier it should be for you to talk about the things you appreciate about them. Um, and so here's some of the things she says, and I'll just point, point some of them out to you, and then we'll conclude. She says these things about God. She refers to him as her Lord, which is to say that she is humble. All of these things speak to her humility. She refers to him in specific as God. Maybe the most important of any of these is she refers to him as Savior. You know why that's important, right? Because Mary knows that in and of herself, she's a sinner and she needs a Savior. Mary knows she wasn't immaculate in the sense that the Catholic movement would suggest. Mary was a sinner. That's why Mary knows she needs a Savior. So she calls him Lord in the text. She calls him God. She refers to him as Savior. She says that he is mighty in verse number 49, that he is holy in, also in verse number 49. Holy is his name. 
in a religious climate in 21st century America that has overemphasized the attribute of God's love, and don't get me wrong, John said God is love. Sure, God is love, but don't overemphasize any of his attributes because just as much as he is love, he is also holy. If you believe that, say amen. He is also holy, which means he's completely separate from sin. And his wrath is set against sinners. In order to really appreciate his love, you got to recognize that he is holy. And he loved us so much that he set his son to die on the cross. That's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But why did his son die on the cross? Because of his holiness. Because we're sinners and we needed a savior. Mary recognized her sinful condition and marveled uh, at her Savior and that he is mighty and that he is holy. Also, the text tells us that he is merciful, verse, 50, uh, verse 51, that his arm is strong. Um, he, verse 51, he hath showed strength with his arm. Um, and then verse 53, that he is the provider of good things, good things, because he fills the hungry with good things. So when she praises God, she is quick to articulate uh, thoughtful things in relationship to his name and to his attributes. And then as she looks at herself, and this idea of magnifying, you know, you have to have both, both in view, you know, to, to really make something, the idea of magnify, make something much bigger, then something else has to become much smaller. You know, famously, he must increase and I must decrease was said by John the Baptist in John 3.30. And here Mary is literally doing that. As she says, Lord and God and Savior and mighty and holy and merciful and strong and provider of good things, she then says of herself that she is one of low estate. She is his handmaiden. And I almost wrote in my notes, erroneously, just the word handmaiden without the word his. And I think it would have been an error to exclude the word his because the word his speaks to the humility. Like she recognizes she is his possession. That pronoun is very important right there. She belongs to him. Hey, in our society, uh, even among Christian people sometimes, there is an unhealthy kind of individualism where uh, I don't belong to anybody. I'm going to do what I want, and it's all about me, and i got to be me. And, and uh, you know who that actually resembles? Is Lucifer in Isaiah 14. I will be exalted above the most high and I will, you know, in the sides of the north and I will, like five or six times in a verse or two, Lucifer is I, 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 and it's this, this kind of individualism. I love how her humility is seen and yes, she says she's of low estate and yes, she's a handmaiden, but she's his handmaiden. She's okay to, to have her life determined uh, by another the one that is her Lord, her God, her Savior. And she finds her purpose not just in accomplishing the whims of her own heart, but she finds purpose in working within the will of her Heavenly Father. As she magnifies Him, she recognizes her humble estate, low estate, His handmaiden. Um, even verse number 50, some people um, erroneously view verse 50 as pride. And that's just not contextually accurate. Verse 50, she says, His mercy is on them that fear Him from generation to generation. Uh, notice verse number 49, He that is mighty hath done to me great things. Um, th this is what people view as Mary being prideful, that, 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 that God has done to her great things, as if she's got some moment of hubris here, and, and nothing could be further from the truth. Some people might look at this like, yeah, Mary is going to be known from generation to generation, and just to mention that would then indicate that she's kind of proud of what's happening in her situation. And again, nothing could be further from the truth. She's just saying that she feels so blessed that, that any generation that's going to hear of how God chose to use her, uh, they're going to say with her, what a privilege, what a humbling privilege that God would use a human instrument in the way that God used young Mary. No pride here at all, just, just layer upon layer of humility, low estate, handmaiden. She references the idea of those that fear the Lord. 
There's no doubt about it. Mary has a reverence for the Lord. Uh, she is one who is not just of low estate, but then she references those who are of low degree. She puts herself in that category. She mentions how God is the provider of good things, and she does that in the way where she says God fills the hungry. Mary's putting herself in the category of the hungry. And, and the idea of rich is mentioned in verse 53, that, that the rich he hath sent empty away. She's putting herself in the poor category, the not just financially poor, but poor in spirit. The reason that the rich are sent away is because they think they already have everything. You're not going to get much from God at all if you don't realize how poor in spirit you really are, like how needy we are, not just financially, but spiritually needy. And so Mary does an amazing job magnifying the Lord and, and decreasing herself so that he is increasing in her life. Um, verse 51 shows this humility. Verse 51, he hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Don't forget 1 Peter 5.5, 5, the idea that God has opposed the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He scatters the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Uh, Mary is very humble here. He, uh, he, uh, the, the Bible says that God uh, uh, honors and gives grace to the humble. So if you wanted a, an additional little outline, verse 51 is about the humble, verse uh, 53 is about the hungry, and verse 54 is about the helpless. Um, and he hath helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And there's references here now to the Old Testament again. Uh, verse 55 is a reference to Genesis 17, 19. He spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And then Mary abode with her, referring to Elizabeth, about three months and returned to her own house. Very likely, Mary stayed throughout Elizabeth's pregnancy. And uh, so it was a really long baby shower. Uh, as she like lodged there uh, through the birth of John the Baptist, very likely. Uh, but a very long baby shower maybe, but certainly a very blessed baby shower. And it's very blessed because the whole thing centers on the gospel. The whole Christmas message is how sinners like us can have a home in a perfect, sacred place called heaven. If you know you're a sinner, would you say Amen. And if you're thankful for the gospel, would you say amen? amen? Would you bow with me, please, for prayer? With our heads bowed and eyes closed before I lead us in prayer, I want to call you to reflect on the ways that the Spirit of God spoke to you. Because we just opened the Bible and we endeavor to walk ourselves through the message of this passage. And so for those hearts that are good ground, it's very likely that as we looked at the Word of God that the Holy Spirit of God communicated to these tender hearts. So how did He do it for you? How did God speak to you? And then what are you going to do with what He just spoke to you by His Spirit and from His Word? How are you going to act on today's text? Will you answer those questions in your heart? And then, will you talk to the Lord about that? That's what this invitation is. It's a time for you to reflect. In a minute, we'll sing, and we'll invite you to come. If you'd like to come and kneel here and, and dedicate these things to the Lord, however he's speaking to you, you come and talk to him about that. And maybe you're here, and you're not sure you're saved. You do know you're a sinner. But there hasn't been a time for you when you've called on the Savior to save your soul. Can I tell you that today is the day of salvation? My wife and I will be down here together, and if you're not sure you're saved, I want you to slip out and come, and we'll have somebody take the Word of God and show you how to be saved. There's a lot of gifts that are given at Christmas, but no gift is greater than to receive the gift of the gospel this Christmas. And so if you're not saved, I hope you'll come. If you are saved and you know God spoke to you, then you make sure to reflect and apply the many ways in which he just communicated with you. So, Father, thank you for these dear people. Thank you for this.
precious place, this church family. Thank you for the many ways you strengthen me through this faith family. And thank you for how you've strengthened all of us as we have humbled our hearts and looked into your word. And so we praise you and we magnify you and we recognize our sinful low estate. Just marvel at your sinlessness and your abundant love and grace. Marveling at all of that and so much more in relationship to your character. So, bless this invitation, and do it, if you would, for your honor and glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and stand, please, as she begins to play, Brother Kaiser, I'll lead us. Number 548, have you in your room for Jesus? come and give us our closing announcements in just a moment, but I just wanted to encourage you to be back tonight at six o'clock. I'm very excited about the message that the Lord has put on my heart to preach, and it has to do with relationships, and um, if, you have, if you have any contact with people at all, <laughs> the message tonight from the Word of God will strengthen you as you endeavor to have healthy relationships one with another. So six o'clock, Brother Luke. Okay, you can have a seat for just a moment. 
We have just a few quick announcements to go over, just a few basic reminders um, for some people. Um, Sunday school teachers meeting, that's going to be taking place on Sunday, January the 2nd. Um, this will take place in the Fellowship Hall. And this is um, basically for all Sunday school teachers and regular substitute teachers. So make sure you put that on your schedule. Um, and then also the security team meeting will have a meeting following the evening service on January 9th. And then also Awana and Thrive Ministries. This is um, the teens as well. Um, there will no, be no evening service for them on December 22nd and December 29th. This doesn't mean there's no church, it just means that Jonathan and I get a break. So make sure you still come on December 22nd and December 29th if you're available. And um, then there is a New Year's Eve um, fellowship that is being planned, but there's not a whole lot scheduled yet. So just, um, just keep your eyes and ears open for that. There is one thing I can tell you, it's on um, December 31st. So. There, there's uh, some information for you. I'm going to ask uh, Brother Hewan, would you mind coming up and closing us in prayer in just a minute? Uh, just We have uh, Miss Christina in the back. If you're a first-time visitor with us, I know that Georgia and I met some over here. I know there's a few. Um, we'd love to have you. Uh, just go back there. We have a special gift for you, and uh, we trust that that will be a blessing to you as well. Also, um, this is the track, the Christmas track that Pastor was talking about. It says, The Biological Impossibility of Christmas. I haven't read it yet, but it looks really good. And so um, make sure you grab some of those uh, and uh, hand them out to people that you come across. Uh, Brother Hewitt. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege and opportunity that it is to meet in your house. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor for the preaching of your word. I'd ask, Lord, that you would help us to ponder on these things, Lord, as we go out and not forget them as we leave church. I'd ask, Lord, that you would keep us safe this afternoon, bring us back to your house tonight. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.